Welcome back to part two of our interview with Michael Boddicker. If you missed part one, go back to two, uh, an episode two weeks ago and you'll hear the first part. But today we're going to do the conclusion. Welcome to the Music History Project. We're your hosts. I'm Elizabeth Dale. And Dan Del Fiorentino. And Mike Mullins. All of our content comes from the Oral History Program, which is sponsored by NAM, the National Association of Music Merchants. And that is a program that is over 3,000 interviews and constantly growing. If you want to check out any of our content or any of the other interviews that aren't featured, please check out our website at www.nam.org slash library. Thanks for joining us for the goodies that are the second part of our Michael Boddicker interview. Uh, in case you're unfamiliar, you need a little refreshing. Michael Boddicker is an American film composer and studio musician specializing in the synthesizer. So we're going to hear kind of the second half of his career, of his story today. And Dan conducted this interview back in the summer of 2013. I really loved uh, the opportunity to display his story because, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier in our first podcast about him, he was really there, uh, you know, with a very strong interest in electronic music, uh, a background in um, organ playing. He was there when these instruments were being introduced in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. And as we're going to hear in a few minutes, uh, when the EMU company started producing uh, synthesizers, he was able to help manipulate some of those and had a word in how some of the uh, products were being produced and created. So uh, a very exciting time. And uh, this is, I, I think, one of my favorite interviews. It's interesting also that uh, my introduction to Michael was walking to his front door and he opened the door and there is a Buchla 100 sitting right in his living room. I thought, OK, his wife is very tolerant. So um, <laughs> so let's hear more of uh, our interview with Michael Boddicker. So one of the things I wanted to ask you, Michael, was since we're talking about gear and the NAM show and all of this is what how could you sum up your experiences regarding seeing the revolution of the synthesizer and the electronic instrumentation? I mean, what was that like for you? Okay. Uh, what uh, I already described for you going there and seeing uh, Roger Powell being a demonstrator, who then went on to be this fabulous rock star and, and brainiac. The um, Another guy who was there... Uh, showing synthesizers in the early days was Tom Piggott. And it's a spectacular musician, spectacular demonstrator. Uh, the only thing I can say is that his talent level was so high that if you saw him do the things and went, wow, I have to have that, took it home, replicating what Tom did was very difficult. <laughs> the, uh, uh, he, he's terrific. The, uh, I got into it because I loved it. I, one of my difficulties today you know, in being a man in the world is that a lot of men go, oh, I need to make a living. This is what I'll do to make a living. I go, I love music. How do I make a living with music? And, and, and I don't love doing it. I've tried doing other stuff. I've even tried just being an executive and in music, and I can't do it. I have to be actively, creatively making music. I just, it drives me. Uh, uh, here at the NAM show, i fell in love with synthesizers and and I, I'm learning about them and and uh, I'm in, in a day when uh, Bob Moog was in the same room with me having me demonstrate the poly Moog, you know, and Bob Moog and Les Paul sitting in the front row watching the the demonstration. And I, it, it was just, for me, a phenomenal period of time. I went, when you could sit in a room with Les Paul and listen to him play and talk about the pickups and the designs and stuff, which we can go on to later. We touched a little bit about the inventors, you know, the, the driving inventors uh, behind these companies and the, the innovations. But when, when 
when you get to sit in a room with these people in a relaxed fashion, not, oh, they're passing through the room, bow down, but you're in the room and you're asking them questions and they're showing you, you know, you know what, what, what is going on with what they've created. Uh, I, I, it, it was just a period of time that was so... Um, at the time, I didn't think, oh, this is, this is deep. This is, I just went, this is where I want to be. This is, the, it, was, it, was, it was a great era. Uh, when, when, when we talk about the synthesizers coming up at Tom Oberheim, I was already living here. I could drive to Santa Monica, and Jim Cooper of JLC, uh, 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 J.L. Cooper Labs, uh, who's now gotten into all this video stuff, he was working for Tom Oberheim and Russ Jones of uh, Audio MIDI, uh, who uh, also before that had built Sun and Acoustic. Uh, he was working with Tom Oberheim, and I got to go in there, and and I'd go in there, and I'd have coffee with these guys, and I'd build a synthesizer with them, and, and or they would build a synth. I don't want to give you. the all I did was put it together in a configuration that worked for me. They're the brains and, and, and the creative forces behind it. The, uh, uh, it was just, it was a terrific era. And I, I got into it in a time when nobody was using synthesizers. It wasn't, well, I'm sorry, a lot of people weren't using synthesizers. Paul Beaver had played on Maxwell Silver Hammer for the Beatles. Uh, you know, there was uh, Paul McCartney used a little bit of it. Uh, George Martin still denies that Paul Beaver was ever involved, uh, but Paul Beaver very clearly was the guy who did the Beatles and the Stones, set up the synthesizer program, did, did whatever. Um, I'm I'm uh, of the era where when I first came to town, one of the the auditions that I did was go over to the Beach Boys studio, and they had a, a ribbon controller with uh, uh, with grease pencil marks on it, so that I could play. And that was that was that was the era I'm from, where this that was the synthesizer use, uh, not where you go into every nightclub. And everybody's got a synthesizer. Everybody's a synthesizer player today. But in that day, uh, I had to work pretty hard to get people to let me use the noises of a synthesizer. You know, um, and and we had uh, things uh, in in those those days. It wasn't limited to being a keyboard instrument. You know, it was still uh, Bob Easton was developing uh, uh, an interface. I still have one on my. Uh, uh, precision bass, uh, uh, a 360 systems uh, uh, a base uh, to MIDI converter. Uh, I, I'm sorry, in that day it wasn't a MIDI converter, it was control voltages and gates out. And um, uh, so, so I'm here kind of uh, meeting at both at the NAM show with these people and, and beginning to work with these people uh, as manufacturers and here in town with the, the local manufacturers. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll get there eventually. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on a name and I have to get there because it was a very important part of development. The, the synthesizers in the 1970s, late 1970s, still the people that were utilizing a lot of synthesizers were uh, the experimental group. And that was mostly, I must say, in R&B music. Soul music, uh, the Isley Brothers, the, uh, you know, uh, I was working with the Jacksons, uh, with the Jackson Five first, and then the Jacksons, and then the guys individually, uh, uh, and and they were very interested in what can we do that's new and completely different, uh, and and uh, I would be creating soundscapes for people. I had, I had at this point a, uh, still a four track tape machine. And I was doing film scores out here for Art Cloakey, the guy who did Gumby, uh, on my four-track tape machine where I would layer different synthesizer parts 
uh, with uh, Stephen Marshall, Stephen St. Croix, whose real name was Stephen Marshall, the Marshall Time Modulator, uh, was a close friend, and uh, we would, uh, he taught me how to uh, calibrate my synthesizer, my ARP 2600, calibrate my Mini Moog, um, so that uh, now I'd gone back even beyond the music part and the plugging in part to, you know, the, 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 Tuning part, uh, uh, worry. Uh, I I still don't consider myself any electronics having any electronics education at all beyond what sounds does it make. You know, I don't know how an amplifier circuit works. I'm not interested in knowing. I'm, I'm interested to know if that amplifier circuit works and it sounds better. But that, that may be one of my shortcomings because I, I meet a lot of guys uh, at, at the Sapphire group that know why that amplifier circuit sounds great and, and they use it to make better, better product. Uh, f- so Stephen Marshall got me into uh, uh, adjusting and uh, modifying. And at that point, I was close enough with Tom Oberheim and Jim Cooper that they would modify my synthesizers for me. So I had a completely patchable are uh, a completely patchable Oberheim six voice, where uh, it was like a modular Moog, only it was a, a, a six voice. And I'm going to digress a little bit, but in those days, um, uh, we still, when I came into Los Angeles, one of the first sessions that I attended was uh, the Rockford Files, Mike Post. And we still, in a, to make a chord on a mini Moog, was to play a part, get another track, play another part, get another track, play another part, that you got a chord. You know, it takes a little bit of arrangement. You know, you have to know what you're going to play and know what you did play and, and, and figure out the parts. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, that still is one of my favorite ways of working because you're working like individuals in an ensemble instead of like, okay, here we just have this organ, and not, not to say b- bad organ, because organ players do a terrific thing, uh, uh, being able to have all that independence, but, but uh, that you have this one piece that comes through like that, as opposed to in an orchestra, you might have 39, 39 lines thick of different parts playing, and they can weave, you know, even in a chord, one note can drop out a beat early, and the other two harder to do on a keyboard without just having it stop you know you you to fade or to add vibrato just to the inner note or just make that inner note a little more present it's it's more difficult when you're playing it all live as opposed to when you're multi-tracking it or having three people play it at once so here we are in a in an era where we're making these records by uh uh overdubbing mini mogs to get chords uh i get a call uh, would you like to go up to uh, uh, Redwood City, uh, right outside of Redwood City, uh, up uh, up Santa Cruz area, uh, Santa Cruz, San Jose area, and I meet with these two guys who have uh, uh, a patchable synthesizer they're calling the Emu, and it's got a polyphonic uh, keyboard on it. And uh, this is when... Oberheim was making the bridge from making SEMs to making uh, a synthesizer that could play two voices and then play four voices at once. And they were getting the technology from Scott uh, and Dave up in uh, at Emu, which was still a con. They were in a condominium that that they uh, uh, rented or owned, and they had one modular Emu set up with a keyboard, and and it didn't play. And it didn't play. Oh, if you want to see one, you have to fly to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and uh, Leon Russell's got one. So I'm going, Leon Russell, wow. You know, and I don't know, it, you know. A lot of people go, oh, Leon Russell, that's the guy who wrote Tightrope or whatever. But he was part, he was back in the Phil Spector days, the piano player, first call piano player on all those dates. Mm-hmm. He played in the Wrecking Crew with Tommy Tedesco and... Uh, uh, Hal Blaine and and Glenn Gamble on guitar and and I, I and 
it, it was that that's still that's a, a phenomenal era and uh, and and you have to understand in those days still musicians you, if you see those pictures they had the guitar amplifiers here they were sitting here on their chairs with their their stands and the guitar amplifier was here and they were all sitting close enough just like you and I are and they all played together in a room and they traded ideas and, and they listened and they blended and there were dynamics and and that's what works, man. That that's music. That kind of you know, it's kind of tying together with the Nam idea, where you're getting in with people and you're really interfacing. Back then, instead of a kid sitting in a computer and then sending a file via internet to somebody else, who then listens to that file back and plays on top of it, you were actually there exchanging all the ideas in real time. And um, so he, uh, here we are. Uh, Did bef- you record the Rockford files? I played on the the theme on the on the TV shows. the The actual uh, record Mike Post played himself. Dan Ferguson played the guitar. Phenomenal guitar player. Oh my goodness! Different recording. I didn't know that. There are two different. There's the one, the television theme, and then the record. Oh yeah. Well, because they don't play the whole record. They don't play three and a half minutes at the beginning, right? right? Uh, Yeah. We. uh, All I remember is the theme on the show. That was a kicking. Song, uh, yeah, it's great. He, he's, uh, Mike Post and, and his partner in, in that day, Pete Carpenter. Oh, yeah. uh, phenomenal. Phenomenal orchestrator, phenomenal creative force. And uh, Mike Post uh, is still the same. He is, he is a, a driving, pop-oriented, uh, uh, driven man that's able to discipline and organize and get accomplished. And uh, I think at one time he had something like 11 shows yeah. going at the same time. What were you going to say? I just, you, were you the one who played the synth stuff on, on the Gumby shows? Uh, on, uh, no, on Gumby, I did, I did three films for Art Cloakie. I did uh, Mandala... The one that sticks out is Mandala, and I know I did two other ones. It was it was a, a an interesting era, and uh, I'll be very uh, uh, kind and elusive and say that that uh, in that day uh, it was still uh, carryover from uh, the late '60s San Francisco psychedelic era, and and it freaked me out. I didn't I didn't know how to do I didn't know how to be part of that, and and it, it uh, so so I didn't continue. In that, but I continued doing film out here uh, with my synthesizer four track, uh, uh, synthesizer and four track, and uh, so there's two stories started here. I, I got I, I'm there. I go up and see Scott and Dave. Uh, is Dave Rossum yeah. uh, at uh, Emu, and I they send me to Tulsa, and I walk in to to Leon Russell's My Blue Heaven, which is a multi tiered performance, like a, a semi circle that that has uh, th- three layers, so that you can have a B three on one layer and a piano on another layer, and a band can set up kind of an amphitheater style uh, to play. And in the room is a, uh, a multiphonic keyboard that uh, uh, is hooked up to a working emu modular. And uh, the guy who's his keyboard tech is Roger Lynn. And, and so now all of a sudden I'm connected with Roger Lynn and about... Two or three years, four years later, I'm sitting in his little house up in the Cahuenga Pass here with uh, Jeff Picaro, who's advising him on whether the groove feels great or not on his new drum machine that he's developing. And it's literally circuit boards sitting there naked circuit boards with a panel of buttons but and he's making adjustments and stuff to get the swing just right for Jeff's approval which if if you know that is no longer available to us Jeff's approval but uh I still use that as a jumping off point mm-hmm. uh uh Jeff Picaro uh always smiled when he played and if he couldn't smile, then he didn't want any part of that music. He smiled when he played, and it had to be uh, had to be felt. I, I, I would liken it to uh, Mozart. Mm. 
where Mozart, you know, he had to, his dad whistled. He would whistle, have whistle games with him, but he didn't allow him to play until he begged to play. He had to beg to play. I had to, please, please let me take lessons. Not, you're going to practice, but please let me play. Please let me take lessons. And then it, what you see in Mozart's life is, is joy. There's a, a joy that just leaps from his music. And uh, uh, Jeff Beccaro was the same way. There was just, he, he dug doing what he was doing, man. And he played every, ta- every day, every time he t- picked up drumsticks or whatever he did. Whether it was, he was a fabulous artist. You know, the artwork on the front of those Toto albums was his artwork. Fabulous artist. And, and when, when I got into, in that experience, you know, okay, not all things that are locked together feel right. You know, and, and about that same time, I'm, I'm working with Quincy on a Michael Jackson record, and we're taking a, a Roland uh, drum machine, and we're trying to pick up sections uh, you know, where you have a different drum pattern for a different section, and, and, uh, which would be great if it was all thought out ahead of time, but it's like, okay, here, now in this section, I want to punch in and change the drum beat. You always had to start at the beginning and lock the sync up. Now there are uh, uh, there are sync points where you you can pretty much jump in on a beat, right? And that day I have to go to the Shakey's on Santa Monica Boulevard and sit there with Dan Garfield while he talks about that he can build this box called the Dr. Click that will then allow me to take my Moog and my Oberheim and my sequential circuits uh, uh, sequencer and my Roland drum machine and take a click off a tape and drive them all together so I can pick up things in certain parts. It was, it, it was a great era. Before it was all computerized and chipped, which is much harder when it, back in the day when it was, it was, you were able to actually go, okay, I'm going to drill a hole in this thing, and I'm going to take two points off of there, and I'm going to run them out to a jack, and now it's doing a customized job that I wanted to do. Uh, as opposed to uh, now I uh, work with a guy in Germany, and I tell him what I want to do. And uh, out of, I mean, I went to so many different people, and they all told me that, that it was impossible to do what I wanted to do. And I found one guy who went, oh, no, I get it. I can do that. He, but then he goes in and he works for, you know, his free time for three months and he brings back and I say, yeah, that's, that's exactly. Now I push that button and it does exactly what I want to do. It's a little different than I'll drill a hole and run two wires to it. But um, So uh, we're uh, now in the day when we're talking about uh, uh, synthesizers starting to want to talk together and I, I meet uh, Dave Smith up at Sequential Circuits, and he's got a whole different approach to life than all these other guys, you know. And, uh, and, and, and we're seeing at that time, and one of the things I, I've had the blessing through NAM to watch is, you know, you, you see how people, these are, 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 are guys who are inventing things in their garages, essentially, who are then turning those businesses into what are now multinational corporations, right? Uh, you know, an organ salesman or an organ repairman from Japan who turns his or- organ repair business into Roland. You know, it, 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 and, and I got to see him when he was introducing the first uh, uh, piano an electronic piano. So my fa- I have one in the next room. My, my favorite playing piano that I own uses a completely different te- technology than any other MIDI keyboard. Uh, it has, uh, it was the first electronic piano for home use that actually uh, the top detached from the bottom. And uh, so to see, uh, see people who some of them took and went, okay, I'm a designer, now uh, I'm, I'm an engineer and an inventor, now I'm the president of a corporation, and then, 
you know, crash and burn, and and uh, and other people who went, okay, I'm not I'm not a great designer, but I'll get great designers, and I'll just be I'll focus on being a businessman, and 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 all the variations in there. Uh, I'm watching, you know, uh, Moog come up and down, Oberheim come up and down, uh, Sequential Circuits did very well, Emu went up, 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 and they've actually grown to the place where they make chips for everybody else, and I don't even think they make any music products anymore, you know, they, they but they make uh, audio chips for other purposes, and um, the... Uh, the joy of watching, uh, I, I think it's a very important lesson for me. What is my core value? What, first off, what is my core interest? And then what is my core value? What has been proven from other people reflecting back to me that I, I have value to them to give? Uh, so, so I have my, my core interest, which I love, music, my core value, people are going, oh, this is, this is what you do for me that works for me. And, and do I stick with that? And how, how can I build that into my happy life, right? How do I make a living? How do I raise a family? How, how do I uh, discipline myself? How do I keep my juices fed? How do I keep, you know, uh, again, the AM show for me is a big part of that. How uh, when I go and I get, I see these people, the people that we're talking about, the, the Bob Mokes and the Tom Oberheims and, and uh, uh, even the marketing guys, and you, you then, uh, you know, and I don't mean to discount that at all. I say with absolute respect, the, the Paul de Benedictus's, uh, uh, the, the Rob Winters, and you go, wow, wow, that, that's, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. How how do they take this piece of music that's doing you know great things? Now we've we've served a value. How do I get that out to the most people? That's that's. How do I get that fed? How do I continue that education? How do I get reminded of it? I have incredibly short memory, right? I have to continually feed that part. I have to get up every day, remind myself life is good. What it is that I'm going to go out and uh, uh, do good uh, with the gifts that God's given me. Uh, uh, one of one of the techniques that I use is attending the NAM show and then maintaining my relationships with the people that I live thousands of miles away from, you know, to to keep me driving forward. So something that Michael Boddicker is very well known for is his work on film scores. And he has worked on some great movies. Um, some examples uh, are uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, um, The Bodyguard, Three Men and a Baby, um, Armed and Dangerous, uh, just to name a, a few. But he's done so many movies. Um, so next up, we're going to hear him talk about film scores. And also, um, he's going to talk about meeting Quincy Jones. Okay, now I'm back. I got a four track. I got, I'm doing film scores. I actually... I actually, as part of this salesmanship thing, would, would literally, a, a, okay, a and Records is already burning. Uh, Herb, uh, Herb, who's a dear friend, still one of the only men who kisses me when I see him. He's just a, he's a great guy. What a creative force. Talk about knowing your core value. He's an artist. He paints. Mm. He paints and he makes music. And uh, and he built, he brought in business partners, marketing partners, A and R partners. He never lost his core value. He never did. He's a he's a, a, a great example of what do you do, what do you do, remain true to yourself in your in your artistry, and still, you know, build entities. And uh, uh, so I'm at Herb Alpert's studio, which is now Henson Studios, but it, it was the old Charlie Chaplin stage that he bought with uh, 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 Jerry Moss. And, uh, he, uh, and I'm working on publishing demos uh, with uh, Henry Louie, who is uh, the producer of Joni Mitchell. 
So in his off time, Henry Louis does publishing demos for Irving Almo, uh, and and I'm there as the piano player on the date, and uh, on the date sa we did multiple, uh, uh, and and so I'm playing on demos and playing piano or organ. I don't even think I was playing synthesizer on on that many white records. I was all the time at Motown, but I'm still being a keyboard player around town for, you know, TV shows and stuff. It's not generally synthesizer-oriented. Um, I, I run into Quincy Jones, and uh, who's just, you know, since, since the time I went to see uh, uh, In the Heat of the Night, right? And, and, and I had said, you know, music by Quincy Jones. I started going out and buying his records and completely... Completely fell in love. He used synthesizer all the time, and and I didn't really know this at the time, but it was Dave Grusin who played most of those synth parts. Dave Grusin is just phenomenally gifted uh, uh, musician, composer, uh, synthesizer player. He 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 never limited himself to the synthesizer as a keyboard. Okay, so. Uh, one of the things that I had never thought of at, up to that point was, you know, taking this voltage control pedal that that we always plugged into the volume control, <laughs> play it like a, an organ volume control. He plugged it into the VCF, and then uh, he uh, he would play that wow, you know, the kind of filter opening, is a, but, but more like a talk box almost. And and that was Grusin. And, um, you know, I modified it a little bit. I used that on the beginning of, of uh, You Are for Lionel Richie, where uh, I take the, the, the voltage control pedal, run it through an attenuator, run it into the filter box. And I remember that day, you know, it, I, I used to show up sometimes in the old days, I used to show up like with 60 synthesizers, and I'm not exaggerating, 60 synthesizers in cases, in racks, and and uh, I would I would be able to do everything that anybody wanted. You know, oh, you, you want a great string sound? Oh, that's this instrument, you know. Not everything did everything in those days, uh, and they certainly didn't do it polyphonically. Uh, uh, so, oh, you want a great brass part? Oh, that's this, you know. And and uh, I had to send. I hadn't brought my modular Moog that day, and I had to send out for my modular Moog. We had to wait an hour. Uh, anyway, so uh, uh, I'm in the parking lot at A and M Records, where all these things are taking place, and uh, uh, I meet Quincy Jones, and in the parking lot. <laughs> I'm going to tell this story, and you're going to have. You're probably going to have to edit it out. I meet him in the parking lot, and and uh, you know, nice to meet you, all that stuff. And he's sitting in his car because he doesn't drive. He won't. He won't drive. He says he stops on downbeats. And uh, the uh, uh, I put my finger to his head and say, "What's? A, do I have to put a gun to your head to let me play synthesizer on one of your records?" And he says. I'm going to be at your house tomorrow at 10 a.m., and the guns are going to be at your head, mother <laughs> and, 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 and he came over to my house at 10 a.m., and we went. He was supposed to be there for an hour. I have chills telling you. Uh, he left at about 7 o'clock that night, and we didn't stop for maybe 15, 16 years after that. We just stayed together the whole time. Me hanging out at his house, his Peggy Lipton cooking, uh, uh, cooking uh, uh, chicken in brags, which I'd never heard of. You know, why would you want to decompose the, the chicken before you eat it? And uh, uh, and uh, 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 you know, his discipline of listening to music, to listening to all kinds of music, but particularly listening to the top forty. You know, looking at the trades. You know. I uh, had a great attorney at that time, Al Schlesinger, who, you know, tried to get me into, I pick it up, I pick the billboard up, 11 o'clock on Sunday, when I hit the, hit the office on Monday, I know everything that happened before. I, I'm, I'm, I'm there, I'm on the same page as everybody else. And uh, Quincy, the same thing, only he did it from a different uh, aspect. He looked at what records were selling and all the elements that made that up. 
what demographic, who the, who, the, who the writers were, who the musicians were, everything, all the makeups of all those top records, and he only listened to the hits. Now, he, in, that, in that aspect, he was listening to the hits. Uh, not that he didn't listen to other kinds of music. Like he, you, you couldn't talk him into listening to, oh, check out this string arrangement. You know, he, you know, he, was, he didn't go, oh, no, no, I never listened to other string arrangements. He, 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 he would listen to that, but, but then his discipline was here's the hits. How do I make hits? How do I how do I make records that people are going to buy? And it was a great experience. So Quincy brought, started bringing me in, and at that day I, I'm playing modular Moog, Oberheim six voice, and mini Moog. I think and I think we still used a, sing, a string ensemble. An ARP string ensemble and uh, an ARP soloist, and uh, the uh, the records that we made, what what he wanted to do with it, like in the Roots days and stuff, where go okay, Michael, make an African flute, you know, modular Moog. How do you? It's, it's a it's relatively complex patches, you know. Is it an African flute? No. It's not an African flute, but it's if you're in the back under dialogue, it's a flavor and it's a color, and that's what Quincy was always talking to me about were colors and flavors, and I mean literally flavors. Lemon, it's got to have more lemon on it. It's got to cut through more. It's got to, you know, uh, one of his favorite things was was to always turn to to Bruce Wadian and say, "Hey, Svens, it needs more spit." And more spit meant that you had to put more reverb on it, you know. But it was always this very earthy communication, and that and that right there started into my speaking a different language because people didn't know synthesizers could do so many things. Um, that that people didn't know how to put it into words. It wasn't like, okay, uh, I, I want it to be like a piccolo. I want it to be like an oboe. I want it to be like a viol. It wasn't that. It was, how do you interpret? I want the sound of flattened ping pong balls taped to the underside of pigeon wings as it flies off. That's what I want. And that's a, that's a real honest to goodness request that I got from Allie Willis you know how, how, and, and how do you now how do you develop this language you got to have a vocabulary which which gets into back into music education you know what's the vocabulary what's what what is the history of my instrument okay if I'm a violist I have to play you know I, I there are pieces back from the uh, 1600s that I can get on forward and I can develop a repertoire right and I then I, now I'm all the way up to what are people doing now with plucking and and and, and uh, uh, bowing and and uh, putting uh, prepared pieces on my my viola and whatever but I've got this whole history history of my instrument started in 1950. And it had to do uh, uh, really uh, 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 with Stockhausen and, and uh, ha- has to do with what was put on tape and manipulated on tape, not what was played live. And um, so now, now we're getting into there's a vocabulary and a repertoire and do, does synthesizer uh, become part of the history of piano? Is it... Piano, organ, harpsichord, that's all, and synthesizer, that's all one. Synthesizer is not a keyboard instrument. That seems to be the controller that most people have gone to using it, but it's, it limits it so much. On, off, or a little control here, or an extra push on the keyboard, that's not that many parameters to change like a violinist who immediately can switch from pizzicato to, to, to uh, 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 pitch bends uh, to uh, vibratos and changing speeds of vibratos and, and all that. I mean, the, it's, 
it's immensely, the interface, the human interface of that instrument is immensely more complex than the keyboard is for a synthesizer. And, and fortunately, I was working with people who didn't think of it as a, a keyboard instrument. Uh, the sound they wanted out of it wasn't a keyboard sound. So as we mentioned in the first episode of our two-part series on Michael Boddicker, there's a pretty good chance that even if the name isn't familiar to you, you've heard some of his work. So if you have not seen some of those big movies that he's been a part of, well, I don't know, I guess you've been living under a rock for the last 30 years. I don't know. (laughs) Um, But also his work with Quincy Jones led to a lot of music that you've probably heard uh, if you've turned on the radio again in the last 20 or 30 years. And we're going to hear... Michael Boddicker talking about one of his favorite projects that he worked with, with Quincy Jones, which is, anybody want to take over? Was it the uh, theme for the TV show Sanford and Son? Oh, God. (laughs) 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 Now that's going to be stuck in my head all day. Thanks a lot. Gosh. Uh, But no, it is actually probably one of the most iconic albums of all time, arguably. Well, that must be Thriller you're talking about. Oh, gosh. You're right. My favorite Quincy project. Um, on the Thriller album, probably my favorite time of working with him, Quincy was still in the mode of... Um, uh, th- th- this might be a long explanation. I've got a, a theory. You see, s- cell phones and cell phone use and the quality of music that people still talk about the era of music that they love. Oh, that 80s music. I love that music. You know, the Earth, Wind, and Fire, and uh, uh, the, the Michael Jackson or the Jackson records, uh, all the Motown records, uh, the Hall and Oates records, all the, those, the, David, the early David Foster era. Uh, in that day, there was a discipline to making music. And we showed up. We had a 10 o'clock session. We were there for sure at 10 o'clock, not sometime afterward. We were there for sure, 10 o'clock, ready to go, happy to be there, uh, making a lot of money, parking lot full of Mercedes and Lincolns and Cadillacs and, uh, and, uh, and loving what we were doing. And uh, the Thriller record with, this was still before Michael wanted to write all the songs, you had... Rod Temperton, the songwriter, the fabulous, world-class, proven hits, huge, you know, songwriter. I want to rock with you, all that. We're there with Thriller. Bruce Wadeen is at the helm. Bruce Wadeen is the engineer, and he's really the guy who controls everything. He's the guy who writes out the roadmap from left to right. He knows if you're going to, hey, we need to put this in the second verse, you're at the second verse. Okay, you're eight beats before two, three, four, five, six, seven, there you go. You know, he he was phenomenally organized, and his way of making records um, was still performance-oriented, where Bruce Swedean would, uh, you'd say, okay, I I played that solo, Uh, uh, give me another track, I'll see if I can play better. Oh, you don't like that one? Let's just erase it. No, 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 Bruce. Bruce, that's a good song. Just let me see if I, I want to creatively see if I can do something different, a little better. Well, if you don't like that one, it's, are you chicken? Uh, you know, let's just erase it. Let's do another one. You know, and, and, and uh, that approach to performance was still live. Not, okay, I'll throw down something that's half in tune, half in time, and then we'll manipulate it till where it lines all up and it sounds wooden. There's a, there, uh, I, I actually saw a demonstration last night uh, with Andy Morris who recorded a lot of the early Motown stuff and he talked about his technique of when he had a guitar player play this line on, uh, was it a Baby Love? Uh, baby Love. There's, there's a guitar line that enters in and he took out the rhythm section and just had the guitar player play to the vocals so that the melodic line that the guitar player played was swinging with the vocal more than it was locking to the track. And and Swedean had all of that 
in his bag of tricks when when you were performing your parts he 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 uh set the stage musically and sonically for you to be in whatever pocket you were supposed to be in at that time i uh, i hope that's not too uh uh, airy fairy, but but I, I that it communicates that that uh, there's a, a real gift to people who are able to come in and convince you that you can give better than you even can at your best. He he draws the best performance out of people by setting the mood in the studio in the work environment. Um, so Quincy. Is here. He's assembled this team. He's got the best horn arranger in the world, Jerry Hay. He's got uh, uh, Gerald Wright, the best string. You know, that's Gerald Wright. Uh, his his string arranging was phenomenal. Uh, 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 you know, all, all, that's all Jerry Hay. You know, phenomenal arrangers doing what they do best in this place. You got the best songwriter in the world at that time, uh, Rod Temperton, who comes in and we're, we're doing this track and uh, trying to lock, you know, electronic drum machines to it and stuff. Uh, uh, and it's going, because it's a starlight, starlight night. And, and he's, uh, uh, we're recording this song. We're already recording it. It's a starlight night. And it's about a guy who takes his girl out to the, the, like the pier for the weekend, uh, for, for the evening, for a date. And, and uh, Quincy's going, you know, just doesn't have the, the grit, you know, just, just. You know, they're, they're trying to uh, man up Michael at that point. You know, that's what you see him dressed in his tuxedo in the front. It's a very manly dress. And, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to make him seem not so soft and delicate, but, but having more testosterone. And uh, uh, so uh, we're there. And I know this has to do with the, the favorite era uh, uh, of Quincy. In, in that day, like I said, we come in at 10 o'clock in the morning. We work till 1 o'clock. We go outside. You, there would never be a phone. No, no phone ever rang in the room. Nobody was ever texting. Nobody was ever getting beeped. Nobody, you, you just didn't do it. You went out. You got your message from the door on your 10-minute break. And while you grabbed a cup of coffee and hit the, the restroom, you looked at your phone message and you either decided you were going to do it on your lunch hour or you returned it right then. And, and within 10 minutes, you were back in the room. Everybody <clears throat> focusing, all those minds focusing every time that music played, every time that music played, listening and going, here's what I can do to make that better. Here's what I can do to make that better. Here's what I can do, you know. So we're there, we're recording a track, uh, and Quincy says he doesn't have enough grit. Rod Temp, about 10 o'clock that night, Rod Temperton says, okay, got it. And he comes back in at 10 o'clock the next day. He's got five verses written about a guy who's out like to a, a scary movie with his girl, and uh, 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 it's Thriller. And he's re- completely rewritten It's a Starlight Night into Thriller. And, and, and what starts flowing in the next three to six hours of, Lily, do you, have a, do you have a wolf sound on there? Can you do, you know? He said, no, but I happen to have a sound effects record. <laughs> Get me the sound effects record. And, and, and we put it into what was a new uh, synthesizer at that time, which is the emulator. And, oh, you know, and there's uh, there are different people that take credit for that. Quincy wants to say that he was the wolf on the on the beginning. Other people say it was Michael. I I say it was the sound effects record. We definitely, absolutely sampled the sound effects record and put the sound effects record on that track. Uh, and uh, uh, and and as you're watching this unfold, just the much. Um, come on, help me here, Victor. Uh, who, who, uh, Vincent Price. I know Vincent Price. Quincy calls up Vincent Price and says, Hey, Vincent, I have, would you read something for us? Would you, would you do a, a, a you know, a read something on a record for me? And the guy 
guy shows up and reads the, the you know, that, that thing that, that, that they wrote out for him that wrought. I mean, it's just phenomenal. And watching the minds put this together with the connections, you know, uh, uh, it, 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 it's, that's my favorite era. That, that Quincy didn't just use, oh, I like that guy. I want to use him as my guitar player. He went, that's, I like that guy. He's a great guitar player. And he's the great, he's the right guitar player for this part. Now, there's another guitar player for this part. And this is the piano player for this song. Just the same way Bruce Swedean went, okay, this one I'm going to mix to uh, a, a half inch two track at 30 ips. No uh, no Dolby. This one I'm mixing to digital because that's that's the character that this this needs. You know, it's it's like the the difference in character for me between ha- playing a B3 uh, with a tall boy Leslie or a 145 or a 122. Is there different sounds, different characters? Uh, they they played Quincy played musicians and arrangers and writers like that. And uh, uh, Bruce played the studio like that. It wasn't just, okay, I've got a console, I've got a tape machine, I've got a mixtape machine, that all goes there. It, it was like, okay, no, there's a character, there's a color. And, and um, that era where there were no interruptions allowed, nobody was ever doing a playback going like this. Nobody was ever checking their email during a playback or, or getting... A text message. No, it just didn't happen. And uh, in fact, the people, the uh, there were a couple of key heads of record companies who used to do their business like that, where they were on a phone underneath the console, and then they'd have to go, "Okay, I'm sorry, I missed that. Could you play that back?" And they were jokes. They were made fun of regularly. The president of Warner Brothers Records at that time. Lenny Warnker, we used to call it the Warnker Shuffle. It had nothing to do with the dance. But he, he listened. He, he ran this record company, huge record company, and he still produced records. And the way he did it was he just put his head down on the console like this. This is the Warnker Shuffle. Put his head on the console like this. And he stayed there for three hours at a time. You know, <laughs> Uninterrupted, focus, listening, being part of. With, 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 you just don't even you don't see it happen today. Uh, and and I believe that that my favorite era is that era, much because of that discipline, because we actually worked, we worked, we all focused all of our energies on on the music. Every time the song came by, we made it better. And usually we made it better times five people in the room. You know, second engineer was even welcome. The second engineers who went on, uh, Ed Cherney, who went on to produce Bonnie Raitt, and, and, and you look at producing Bonnie Raitt, it's not just, I'm going to record her. I mean, there's, there, He's applied the same techniques, the same color choices, you know, the same mood. There, it's it's a. Uh, I keep using the word rich, but it's it's a very rich process. Uh, 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 there's a lot of thought, a lot of care. There's a lot of artistry behind being on this side of the glass to elicit the best performance. And Ed Cherney was the second engineer on those records that I was just talking about with Quincy and Bruce. And um, he went on, uh, he went on to apply that. And even in that day, he was, he wasn't like bored in the back of the room waiting for something to happen. He was there looking, watching every meter, watching every patch, watching every musician, watching everything. Great, great era. Great era. That all ended. That all ended uh, when it got uh, to the uh, place where uh, there was you know, life became too complicated, where legal issues start taking over and interrupting your cont- complete day. 
you know, because when somebody says you have to be in court at 8 a.m. to keep out of jail and you've got musicians booked for a day, <laughs> you know, you still got to show up at court. You, 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 you don't, you, you go to court. And, and uh, things got more complex on a lot of different levels where people were ne not necessarily listening every time. There were other issues clouding. And that whole, whole thing stopped. The whole thing stopped. Uh, that whole camp stopped making hit records. I think we, after Quincy and Michael broke up, we, um, there's only one hit record between the two of them. And it was Michael, it was uh, Bill Battrell who made it, Black or White. I played on that, and uh, I was there. Bill Battrell was there. You know, a couple of the guys involved, but that was it. You know, and, and that was the last hit. That was the last hit out of that whole thing. All the other records that were hits that I talked to you about were all made before in the manner that I talked about. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, he was a great singer, Michael Jackson. He's a great singer. He's a great dancer. He's a great star. And when he had a great producer and a great engineer and a great songwriter and a great string arranger and a great horn arranger and a great rhythm arranger and, and the best drummers in the world and the best guitar players in the world and all that instead of now really people try to go, okay, here's my computer. I can do everything. It would have been like me with my little four-track tape machine saying, this is the only musical experience I want to have. Yes, I can make electronic mo noises and put them to film, but is there something different than that that I could do that would be another musical experience? Um, I, I had to get to the place where I, you know, I've written for 60-piece orchestras. I've written for 20-piece choirs. I've written for eight snare drums. The, eight, the sound of eight snare drums is never going to come out of a synthesizer. You know, that wave of... You know, that, that you get out of eight drummers in a great room just can't you can't synthesize it you can, you can't even sample it you know once you sample it and you start uh um uh, uh degrading by chopping it up into little places and and speeding the sample rate down so that you can get more memory on an instrument and stuff like that or only using every other note or every four notes or whatever the the impact of that that real instrument play, being played live by real human beings in an acoustic space goes away. I, I, I apologize, Dan. I, I know I've gone all over the place That's here funny. with this stuff, but uh, it's... Yeah, I appreciate uh, you talking to us about this. This is great. So, um, since you were mentioning uh, Thriller, is there, a, is there a feature of you in there that we could listen to? Is there a, you mean uh, where I could play it for you right now? No, no. I mean in the album when we listen to it. Where, where do we hear you that you're <sighs> most excited to tell us about? Well, uh, you know, I, the most apparent solo that I have is on the beginning uh, of there's there's on I'm bad. There's there's a solo that starts out with Jimmy Smith and organ. And this was in the beginning of the end where Michael was working and getting his ideas in one studio and Quincy was trying to make a record in another one. Mm -hmm. and, and so we had Jimmy Smith playing MIDI organ, which at that point was just all over the map. I mean, you know, the, the, the MIDI notes that it would spit out when he would play were just like <laughs> noise. And uh, uh, so we, we got uh, the beginning of the solo and then after that to... Complete the solo. Greg Fillingaines and I, uh, uh, trance, you know, had had the MIDI out from his organ. Starts with his organ solo, goes transitions into the organ solo plus a synthesizer. Uh, ends with the synthesizer with the pitch bend thing on it, right? The and, and um, the beginning on. Uh, the way you make me feel with the, it's very simple, but the wop 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 wop. You know the, uh, uh, the one of the things that I'm most pleased with 
uh, and I have to because some of them blur together. The uh, I I I believe that I did the first snap. You know, there's a where you take the the VC, a resonant VCF filter and you put an envelope generator into it that's just a spike, and and then uh, and. And it's been sampled and used on so many, uh, uh, like rap records and stuff since, but but that was the first usage. Uh, I have uh, uh, ooh, 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 that was Michael's voice. I'm telling you, we're there. I've got an emulator one, brand new out of the box, serial number 001, which I sent back to the factory, came back a different serial number, but it was serial number 001. And uh, uh, I, on the day that we got it, James Ingram, Michael McDonald, and Michael Jackson all sang into it, had no idea. Okay, guys, sing, all right, I need you each to sing oohs, ohs, ahs. Still have the library. You know, but they didn't think about, oh, so he's going to be able to use my voice to play other parts on other records. or worry. It was just like, wow, check this out. We can play a melody line. And, 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 and the, the beautiful part about that example, I think, uh, on a Michael Jackson record, is that's not a pure sample. You know, if you hear it, it's got like a, a scoop in it. Ooh, 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 ooh. You know? It, it wasn't a clean take. And and that's a lot of what I like in music. It's got character, you know? It's like sometimes like the, the what were they thinking on California Dreaming? The, the, the flute part is so out of tune. But... You, you you can sing the whole flute part and 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 it's it's you know it's it's like taking your imperfection and turning it into your most valued feature okay um, the synthesizers uh what else, what other synthesizers you know i i like the the vocoder on pyt you know that that was fun. I don't think it was the best. It wasn't as good as uh, uh, the um, "Let's Groove Tonight." You know the the vocoder sound. We spent a little more time on "Let's Groove Tonight," and uh, but you know there was not a lot of patience for. But I. <laughs> Quincy, Quincy used to call that uh, trying to make a record with synthesizers is like trying to paint a 747 with a Q-tip, and and uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, and, uh, 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 and he also used to say that leaving me in a studio to myself was like leaving Dracula in the blood bank, and uh, and uh, uh, but, but, but which I guess is which which is. An extreme compliment, and I'm going to take it as a compliment. We could do so much. There's so much with a synthesizer that you can do. You're not limited. Again, we can we can synthesize sound effects. Uh, uh, we can synthesize size, uh, uh, human sounds. We can certainly play back all the foley, all the noises uh, uh, of real samples, but you can synthesize them as well. Uh, you can take and make new noises. You know, what Ben Burt does with sound effects, you know, where you, you take uh, a real sound, a sound of a balloon, and you slow it down two octaves and put a little processing on it, and all of a sudden you've got a <laughs> sound of an animal. You know, it, it's, 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 it's phenomenal what we can do. The, the problem is, you know, how do you focus it into this is what we're going to do. And, um, you know, yeah, the, we can make a string, give me a string sound, okay? What kind of string sound? I have 10,000 string sounds. You want an electronic string sound? You want a Selena string sound? You, want, you know, I've, I've, uh, then it comes to the flavor and the taste. And uh, it, it's one of the things that's, I find exciting about it is it's so broad, you know, so broad. And yet the needs, because we're still living in a physical world, uh, I, I was with guys last night who were talking about still making mono records. And I said, is it important to worry about the face? He, in the old day of Motown, 
dig this. Guy Costa used to take the guitar players who were playing on the Motown records, and he used to pre-approve their guitars that they were allowed to play to see whether or not their Telecaster was wired properly in phase or out of phase. Mm -hmm. So that when he had two guitars, that both would be in phase. Right? So that when you went down to mono, nothing canceled out. Well, my question was, is that important today? He said, what's your kid listen to? Do you listen to speakers out of his, out of his uh, iPhone? Does he listen off an iPad? It's still mono. It's still mono. How? We're, we're still, when we make music, you might be able to make the biggest, fattest bass sound in the world, but when it gets recorded and played back on somebody's TV, what's it going to sound like? So you have to worry about how do I contain it? How do I roll, you know, everything? At those early records of Motown, they had uh, a high-pass filter on the basses. Not like, oh, I want as much bass as I can get. I want to shake the house. They had a high-pass filter on them. So when you played on your car radio, it didn't blow out your speakers and you could turn it up. Brilliant. Brilliant. Artistic cho choices. So here we are in synthesizers. How do I take and uh, synthesize things that will translate through different mediums. And uh, I can tell you, during that same time, I was very much into my Fairlight, which was a 100K sampler at the time. And that 100K sampler, I can tell you, when we recorded it onto a 24-track tape machine, and they mixed to a six-stripe mag, and they took that six-stripe mag, and they made a Music Master copy off of it that they ran on the dub stage, and then they mixed that six-stripe Music Master down to their composite master, and then they made a safety of that that they ran all the copies off of that got uh, uh, distributed to all the theaters that... I could tell the difference between my fair light after eight generations down as compared to another sampler, a, a, a lower quality sampler. And, and the, all the moving parts in synthesizers are great. They're still, you still come down to I'm a musical instrument or I'm a sound generating instrument. How do I make it come out of the other end of an iPhone and in an Atmos theater. How do I make it sound great in both places? Uh, but um, it's, been a fun, it's been a fun ride watching it from monophonic, monophonic, overdub three, to one guy, Alan Silvestri, one of my favorite film composers today, who uses electronics. He... He has it now down. He got rid of everything. He got rid of his studio. He got rid of everything. He has a pair of speakers in a trailer with his Mac Pro, and he can do it. He does all of his mock-ups, all of his composition, everything there. Okay? Does it replace the orchestra in the room? No. He still has to, okay, live orchestra. Michael Giacchino mocks the whole thing up in DP, and then they translate it, you know, put, put it into uh, Sibelius and print the parts. And then he comes in and the orchestra plays it live. And he insists that they play it live. He, and, and, and I said, so what happens when they tell you they don't have the budget for you to have a million dollars for an orchestra? Or, you know, what, what happens? He says, well, you know, there are certain people you want to work with and certain people you don't. And, you know, maybe that's just not the person I work with. Okay, so that will wrap up our uh, two-part interview with Michael Boddicker that was uh, recorded in 2013. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. It was uh, really exciting for me to have the opportunity to uh, meet and interview him. And since that time, as uh, earlier discussed, Mike has been a real big part of our oral history program and served us uh, his support and helping us connect with other people that we've also interviewed. So uh, a special thanks to Michael uh, and all of his support and to um, to all of you for listening. You guys want to add anything else? Uh, if you have any ideas for future NAM oral history interviews or episode ideas, please send us an email to library at NAM dot org so we can take them under consideration thanks for listening bye bye